Good evening, everyone. Thanks, Simon, and uh, thanks very much to Just One Lap for having me and also to the JSC for having me. Most of all, thank you for taking time out in your evening to come and listen to what I have to say. Hopefully, I will make it, uh, make it worthwhile. So tonight, I'm going to just share with you uh, some basics around index investing, um, and then I'm going to touch on some of the products uh, that we run. I'll hold questions until the end. Um, but it's interesting, you know, key to index investing is to keep costs low. And I see this afternoon the interest rates have been hiked by, by the Reserve Bank. So I saw per million rand bond, it's now going to cost you an extra 160 bucks or something a month. Uh, so we all got to tighten our belts a bit as interest rates start to climb. And, and it does show that, uh, you know, um, every cost saving uh, is important um, in life. Okay, in terms of one of the comments Simon made, uh, we've recently rebranded our business to Core Shares. Well, why Core Shares? Um, really, the spirit behind the name is to embrace the, the um, approach to portfolio construction using the Core and Satellite approach. Okay, So basically, as a pass passive investment management firm, we believe there is indeed space for both active and uh, passive investing. But we do, however, believe that index investing should form the core of your portfolio. Why? Well, it's well diversified, low cost, um, it's for the long term, and arguably uh, better returns. I'm going to touch on that uh, later. So Core Shares is the name of uh, Grinrod's passive business going forward. It will house our ETF aspirations and any other work that we do, do in the passive space. So an energetic uh, passive brand that you'll see more and more uh, in the marketplace. We currently have six ETFs in, the, in trading on the exchange, which you'll see from the pamphlet we've handed out. Uh, we're also due to take over the two Nedbank ETFs later in the year, um, and we're going to be listing even more ETFs over and above that. So, you know, really in terms of the future of financial services and the future of asset management, I, I believe it's going to be a big space in terms of how one constructs uh, investing going into the future. Um, I have recently come back from uh, Europe where I attended one of the big global ETF conferences there, um, and it really is becoming mainstream in terms of how people approach, uh, approach wealth management. Okay, so what is index investing? Let me start from the beginning and sort of lay out some basic sort of groundwork. And what I'm going to try and do here is not talk in any sort of technical speak so that everyone understands we're all on the same page and then we'll get a little bit more technical later on. So index investing. Firstly, what the hell is an index? Okay. Now, the idea of an index has been around for about 110, 120 odd years, where in the United States, in New York specifically, Charles Dow who at the time was the editor of the Wall Street Journal, realized that there was a need in the marketplace okay, to communicate with the everyday investor as to how the general market was doing, how the general stock market was doing. Okay, So he got together with Eric Jones, mate of his, who was a statistician, and together they constructed what we now know today as the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Okay, It's a mathematical exercise to show the general market or the general population, the investor base, how the market is doing, how the stock market is doing. Okay, so it's a mathematical representation. Most indexes are constructed as follows. Share A uh, is worth 100 Rand, share B is worth 50 Rand. Share A in an index will have twice the weighting as share B. Okay, that's known as a market cap weighted index. Largest company has the largest weighting, smallest company has the smallest weighting. And that's how most mainstream indices are put together, the S&P 500, the, the, the FTSE index in London, the CAC, um, the ASX in Australia, and indeed in South Africa, when you watch e-news in the evening, you're listening to how the All Share Index or the Top 40 Index is done in a particular day. And that index is constructed by saying, how did the biggest company do? Well, they did well today, therefore we will attach that performance a high weighting. The smaller companies, they didn't do so well, but that, is, that matters less Therefore, we'll give that a lesser weighting. Okay, so that's market, a market cap weighted index. And that is the most traditional way to construct an index. Largest company, largest weighting. Smallest company, smallest uh, weighting. In finance, we love to get technical about things. So the academics have given it a term called beta. Okay, so the market, as represented by the size weighted index, is known as beta. All right, so if Simon and I have a beer afterwards and we're talking about the markets generally, we're talking about how beta is doing. Okay, so it's the second letter of the Greek alphabet. Why we follow the Greek alphabet today in financial services is beyond me, uh, given the current circumstances. But we do, we use their, 
the, the, the B letter to represent the market, and guess what? We use the A letter to represent our performance. Alpha. It's also part of the part of the Greek uh, Greek alphabet. Okay. So beta is the market return. Alpha, the expression that you've also heard, is any performance that an investor can get over and above the general market. Okay. How do you get out performance over and above the general market? Well, you've got to take positions in the market that differs to a market cap weighted index. So today, for instance, Anglo-American, which used to be the darling of our exchange, has fallen down to about 4 or 5% of our overall exchange, okay, as a, as a percentage of, of beta, as a percentage of the market cap weighted index. So some investors will say, of the money that I have to invest, I'm going to invest in Anglo-American 4%. I'm going to take the index weighting. Okay, well, now you're not taking a bet against the index. Now you're investing alongside the index. But some investors will take bigger positions, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10% in Anglos. Some will have no Anglo-American shares in their portfolio. If Anglo-American has a particularly good year, the guys who invested more than the index would have, gotten, would have received alpha. Those who under-invested would have would have received a, a worse return. Okay, the guys who received four who put four percent index weighting would have had that good return as a percentage of the index, right? Okay, so in terms of the active and passive debate, fund managers like Alan Gray, Coronation Investex, being the sort of the big three ones together with Sunim and Old Mutual, will pay fund managers to deliver a return that gives you alpha, basically. Okay, they're going to take bets against the index and try and get out performance. Of course, as soon as you start taking a bet against an index, you might outperform on the one hand, but you could equally underperform because your, your bet could have, could have been wrong. The weighting that you applied to a particular stock could have, could have been wrong. Okay, so when the idea of passive ex is explained to the general market, there are kind of four main theories around it. So I'm going to share the four with you quickly. This guy is uh, John Bogle. He's the founder of Vanguard. Uh, Vanguard is today the world's biggest mutual fund. It's based in the US. Um, and he's thought to be one of the top 100 thinkers in the world. <coughs> Highly acclaimed uh, person. He, he's written lots of books. I would encourage you to read them. Um, and together with some of his colleagues, they've developed a concept called playing the winner's game. And I'm going to take you through the winner's game in a minute. But when you read his book, uh, books. Uh, he often introduces the Gotrox parable. It's one of the sort of opening paragraphs in some of his books. Now, the Gotrox parable goes as follows. There's this family called the Gotrox, and they own every single stock in the market. Okay. It's a big family, though, and all the, all the shares in the market, and have done so forever. And they're enormously wealthy, obviously, because as time has gone on, as decades have ticked over, the underlying companies have generated earnings and paid dividends, and, and their wealth has grown over time, okay, as, as a family. Until one day, a smooth-talking stockbroker arrives and convinces the one brother to sell to his cousin, who in turn t sells to his aunt, who sells to her sister, who trades with the grandfather, who sells some shares to the wife. A few, few weeks later, they reconvene as a family, and for some other reason, the rate of their wealth creation had started to slow. So they don't understand this, and they employ more brokers, more advisors, and then they're not sure if those advisors are doing well, so they get some advisors to watch the advisors. And so the, the, the churn and the money that they spend in terms of managing this portfolio grows and grows. Guess what? In a few months' time, they meet as a family, and their rate of growth had slowed even more. Until the, the wise old owl in the family said, well, isn't it obvious that the rate of our investment growth has slowed? It's because of all these people that we are paying to now give advice, whereas before as a family, we took no advice. We just owned all the shares and there were no costs in our lives. Furthermore, as the family traded with each other, they were incurring capital gains tax and triggering other taxes in their portfolio management. Okay, so it's a simplistic story, and I appreciate that, but it's, it's important nevertheless that costs erode investment value over time. Consider someone who starts saving at the age of 25 for retirement and he chooses a product with a, a charge of half a percent versus a product with a charge of 1%. That's half a percent compounded for his entire career of 30, 35 years. Okay, now it doesn't take a maths boffin to work out that that's like 40% on, on some of his initial savings. Okay, so, so it can be very, very significant in terms of that, that cost saving and the compounded effect of costs um, over time. William Sharp, who's another um, 
brainy guy who I'm about to introduce to you. He's a Nobel uh, Prize winner. He is quoted as saying that someone who saves for retirement, who uses low-cost products versus high-cost products, can expect um, a standard of living in retirement that is 20% higher than someone who's in a, in a, in a high-cost product. 20%. That's significant, depending on you know what life you're trying to set up in retirement. So you know it's it's it could be bread and butter on the table, or it could be extra golf games or spa day, whatever, whatever it means to you in retirement. Okay, but it can be significant. So costs matter, and as I introduced up front, costs the cost debate is that is one of sort of the cornerstone arguments for index investing, generally speaking, because the products. Uh, that are based on index investing are, are way cheaper. Okay, and we're going to get to that just now as well. The other argument that Bogle always puts forward is that when investing, stock markets don't give you returns. The underlying investments give you the returns. And what do I mean by that? When you're traveling home at night in the evening in Johannesburg, and David Shapiro is talking to Bruce Whitfield on 702, and they're talking about the retail sector, how SPA has done and how Pick and Pay has done and how ShopRite has done. And potentially there's an expert who comes on later to say, well, there's an opportunity to sell shop right now, buy pick and pay, then sell pick and pay later and buy spa. And through doing that process, you might make a buck out of the market. They're right, you might. But you can't make sustainable returns trading in shares on the, in the market. That's not actually a sustainable way to earn returns in the market. The real way to earn returns in the market is to own all three. We all shop at those shops from time to time. They're all going to grow earnings over time. Over time. So his argument is allow the underlying investments to give you the returns. Allow pick and pay, shop right and spa to grow their earnings, to grow their customers, to grow their margins and deliver earnings in that way rather than trading in their, in their shares, which is just a paper trade. To, to make returns over time, okay? And what he's done in this graph, which again he puts in all his books, is he pulls up the, 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 um, the uh, returns in the US market over a 100-year period, and he looks at the earnings over a 100-year period. And guess what? The earnings more or less correlate to the market over time. So it's not as if the stock market is going to give you something different to how the underlying investments have done. It's going to give you the same over time. So if that's your strategy to invest in actual investments, invest in the companies themselves, well, then guess what? You want to do that in the most diversified fashion, and you want to do that at, at, a, at a low cost. Okay, so that's sort of a cornerstone of his argument. Okay, now for my explanation of the winner's game. Remember, I was just talking to you about that just now. So uh, Vanguard, uh, where John Bogle's the founder, he's got another colleague there called Ch Charles Ellis, who's written a book called Playing the Winner's Game. All right. Who wants to be part of the winner's game? Come on, guys. Everyone wants to be a winner, right? So the, winner game, the winner's game works like this. You are all of the investors in the market right here in the room, okay? This circle represents the bucket of returns available from the stock market this year, okay? As represented by the top 50 index, which is a local S&P index, okay? It represents about 90% of our market. It's a weighted average return because in the bucket, the bigger shares are going to add more than the smaller shares. So it's a weighted average return. Now I'm going to split the audience in half. This side of the room is going to invest in that strategy passively. So you're just going to buy the index simplistically. Okay. So we, we, here, we, here we are. So the passive side of the room, well, let's use that side rather. And the other side is going to invest actively. Okay. The passive side is going to pay 30 basis points. The active side is going to pay more than a percent. On aggregate, the active side cannot outperform the passive side mathematically. It's impossible. Yet, on average, they've paid over a percent. On average, they've paid under 30 basis points. The passive side of the room are the winners. As, as an aggregate, the active side of the room, as an aggregate, are the losers. Now, that's a math mathematical truism that no one can get away for, from, okay? Um, and, and that is the power of index investing, that any active manager who sets out to outperform the index is fighting against the rule of averages and the law of averages, okay? So, so they're handicapped, and they need to catch up by 70 basis points all the time, compounded over time, all right? So that is a simple argument around winners and, and, and losers. So investing in an index um, at a low cost would be, in Vanguard's uh, mind, playing the winner's game. 
And then lastly, the last sort of cornerstone of, of index investing is from this guy, Eugene Farmer, who, who very recently won a Nobel Prize, I think about two years ago, who in the 70s wrote a paper called The Efficient Market Hypothesis. And basically, it, it, the idea is as follows. Let's go back to the pick and pay spa shop right example. <laughs> Those companies are listed companies. They've got investment relations uh, offices. They have to report all their stuff on SENS. They've got about 10 journalists watching every last step that they do. They hold investor presentations and so forth. Eugene Farmer says basically in the efficient market hypothesis, and pardon, pardon the jargon, that basically as the market knows everything there is to know about those companies because they're reporting publicly, they have to report publicly, then it's impossible for that share to be over or undervalued. Now, it's a contentious piece of theory. He says if the market all gets given the same information at the same time, well, then how can there be a share that is over or underpriced? Because the market would just panel beat it till it's fairly priced, not so. That is his theory. Highly contentious in financial services, but he has won a Nobel Prize for the work, so we'll give him some, some credit. The detractors from this argument would say, well, if the market is fairly priced the whole time, how can we have stock market collapses? And it's a, and it's a valid point. All right. But it's, it's sort of one of the cornerstones of passive investing. Okay. So those are the main merits for investing in a market cap weighted index at the lowest possible cost, playing the winner's game according to, to Vanguard. Our business, Core Shares, listed uh, the top 50 index uh, in April of this year. Top 50 versus top 40. Many of you will know the top 40 index. S&P Dow Jones, who are global index firms, so they calculate the Dow Jones Industrial Average in America. They calculate the S&P 500 in America. They've started to calculate indexes in our market, together with FTSE JSC, who normally calculate the index in our market. So they've come up with the concept, the top 50, it's the 50 biggest stocks uh, in our market, and we've lift, listed an ETF charging a fee of 20, 20 um, basis points. If you look on a back-tested basis over one year, three years, and five years, it's actually performed, outperformed the top 40 index. Why is that? Well, you're getting extra depth into the market in terms of the next 10 biggest companies. And you hope over time that the, having additional depth into the market, additional diversification will give you that additional return and slightly less risk as well. So we're very pleased with this index. We think it's a nice addition to the market and a nice option. Instead of investing in the top 40, the top 50, it's just a broader representation uh, of the market, generally speaking. Those are the stocks that are in the ETF. So buying one ETF, you can get exposure to the entire South African index. And what's amazing about our index is that when, um, you know, I was learning about finance, you know, I was taught that this was a resource economy. We were dominated by mining stocks. Well, guess what? Not so much anymore. We've got major industrial companies like NASPERS, like SAB, et cetera, that are actually the two biggest shares in our market. Most of the miners are actually sort of way further down, down the index. So we've got a well-spread market across consumer discretionary finance, uh, finances, materials as mining, consumer staples would be uh, your your uh, your retailers, and then obviously the, the telecommunications, healthcare, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so by buying one ETF, the core shares top 50, you get exposure to all 50 stocks on a market cap weighted basis, and you're potentially playing the winner's game. All right, now in terms of how I split the audience up just now, there was the active camp, and there was the um, and the, and there was the passive camp. Inside the active camp, there would have been some that would have outperformed the index. As an average, they couldn't, but there would have been some in that quarter who did, all right? And maybe there are people in that half that said, Gareth, you know, you're wrong. You know, I didn't strive to be average at school. I'm sure as hell not going to strive to be average as an investor. Wisdom in that, I don't know, but, but let's go on with that for a bit. So what has happened recently in the indexing world is that um, – Basically, big uh, thought leaders in the finance space have said, is there a better way of constructing an index other than using size as the determinant for weighting? Okay, so at the moment, NASPERS is our biggest company, so it's got the biggest weighting in the top 40, uh, top 40 index. But are there better ways to approach it? Can we use other factors to put together an index, right? So we're still being true to passive. We're still rules-based. We're still transparent. We're still well diversified. When the portfolio is put together, it's still using low cost. Okay. 
Yes, there is, is the answer to, the, to, to that question. There's absolutely other ways. So what if we use other variables other than size to construct an index? Any ideas how we might do that? Okay, let me try. Dividend yield. Let's put an uh, index together of companies that pay a particularly good dividend. Sound like a good idea? Let's put an index together of companies that are not volatile. Let's put an uh, index together of companies that when the market's doing well, these shares do particularly well because they're sort of high risk, high reward type, type stocks. Let's put an index together of companies that have got very consistent return on equities as from a back-tested basis, uh, very conservative uh, uh, gearing ratios. Let's put an index like that together. And this is the new term, uh, and it's a big global buzzword in, 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 in investing circles called smart beta. So, and, and it's contentious, the name, because it implies that the previous beta that I was explaining is somehow dumb. It's not at all. Okay. Bogle, the top 100 thinker who I was just talking about, he hates this. He thinks that it's a mistake. He thinks that it's going to lead to people underperforming the average. And he's right, because you're taking bets against the average. You might outperform, you might underperform. So he hates it. He thinks it's a move away from the simplistic market cap weighted approach. However, there are certain things that you can get out of it. Okay, there are certain uh, returns um, that you can get out of it, and certain benefits that you can bring into your portfolio uh, that that you get out of it. So this is smart beta. When I was at that conference, I was just talking about earlier. There was a guy there called Rob Arnott. Rob Arnott um, writes lots of articles in the U.S. He's widely published these days. He runs a firm in California called Raffi Research Affiliates Fundamental Indexing. You might have seen the Raffi brand in our ETFs. So he's sort of the doyon of the smart beta space. And he says that smart beta is basically any strategy where you move away from, from company size weighting an index into an, another, another particular factor. Okay, so here you have it. You have normal beta that I was explaining earlier, and you have alpha, the hope of alpha. It's not guaranteed, okay? <laughs> when trying to achieve alpha, there's the whiz kid fund manager who somehow looks into the future picks technologies that are going to be winners into the future or management teams that are going to be uh, big in the future or markets that are going to be big in the future. And through doing that, through his wisdom, he's able to give you alpha. The other way of getting alpha is to dive into these factors. So uh, value investing or quality investing, momentum investing. So those are various factors that have been um, uh, exploited in the market and put into indexes in the form of smart beta. Now, one of the problems with smart beta is that as soon as you move away from a market cap weighted index, the number of variations that you can do against a, a, a market are, is infinite. Okay, so uh, it's hell of a confusing for the general market because there's so many different indexes that can be put together when you move away from size weighted indexes. Okay, so what's happened recently, and which I appreciate as someone who's working in this full time, is that the index houses have started to summarize it, and they've said of the, all the various smart beta factors, these are the sort of four or five major factors that we think as an investment universe you should concentrate on. So value is a factor. Warren Buffett, he's obviously the big value, famous value investor. What does he mean when he says he's a value investor? Well, he looks for companies that are undervalued by some sort of matrix. Maybe they've got a high PE, maybe they've got a high dividend yield. A lot of what he says and a lot of the things that he describes can be built into an index. So that would be a value index. Volatility, looking at stocks that have got low levels of volatility, momentum, companies that are running, uh, you invest in those. Size, looking at indexes with a bias towards mid-cap and small-cap uh, shares, and then quality companies with consistent return on equities, low debt ratios, stable management teams, et cetera, et cetera. Things like that that can be pulled, pulled into an index, pulled into a rules-based environment. Okay. So let's look at some of the smart beta strategies that, that we run. The first uh, that I'm very proud about is the uh, Dividend Aristocrats uh, Index. It's a nice name, isn't it? It's not our name. Uh, S&P's name. Would you believe that our, this, we've got this ETF trading on the JSC. We listed it in April last year. It's cousin that trades in New York, the U.S. Dividend Aristocrats ETF that is run by State Street. It's got 48 billion U.S. dollars in one ETF. Okay, so it's a hugely, hugely popular uh, strategy in the U.S. And basically what this index does is it invests in companies that pay a consistent and growing dividend stream. 
Okay, so who are companies that would do that? Well, they're companies that have got prudent cash flows. They're companies that are stable, that are mature, that are quality type, type companies. In our market, there are currently 27 companies that meet the local criteria for dividend aristocrats. They've maintained and grown their dividends for five years. Then you become the South African dividend aristocrat and you come inside of this uh, index. And since we listed it last year uh, in April, it's done incredibly well. And I'm, I, and I'm very, very proud of it. I know there are a couple of investors um, in the room. So that's an example of uh, a smart beta strategy. So you can see the one-year return first, the All Share Index um, and the Dividend Plus Index as well. So it's, it's done particularly well. And what's also pleasing about it is actually less risky than the general market uh, too. So uh, a really good portfolio. But it comes with a word of caution that, of course, if it can outperform the market by – What's that? 17%. Guess what? It can underperform the market too. So when you invest in the index, you need to read the documentation that's available from us carefully and understand that you're investing in something that's slightly different from the general market. At the moment, we don't have any resource shares in that portfolio. Why? Because the resource sector has been battling. The mining sector has been battling. They haven't been paying consistent growing dividends. So they're out. The whole mining sector, the whole resource sector is out of this portfolio. If mining resources have a big turnaround for whatever reason, this index isn't going to benefit from that. Okay. So to, to be a dividend aristocrat, it's coupon. So if it's paid a dividend last year of one rand, this year it's got to pay one rand or more, following your one rand or more, whatever the – so it's got to make incremental changes on the dividend that it pays out. The Divi Plus Index, which is a FTSE JSC index, is designed differently. So ours is back-tested, which companies have paid a dividend and grown that dividend. The Divi Plus Index says, right now, which shares in our market are analysts saying have got a high forward dividend yield? Which ones are we expecting to have a high dividend yield into the future? Completely different exercise. Okay, it says nothing about their previous dividends. It's just saying, based on today's share price, we think it's going to have a high dividend yield. It could have a high dividend yield because its share price has been moving down, as was the case with the many, a lot of resource companies. So the Divi Plus Index actually has a lot of resource companies in there because the analysts keep forecasting good dividends coming from the mining shares or high dividends, and the share prices of the mining stocks keep falling, so the dividend yield keeps pushing up and up and up. So it's a different type of dividend dividend uh, uh, strategy. But thank you for the question. No, so, we, we will drop that particular share at the next date, at the next... We'll be sitting on a trading substantial we'll be, There are 27 shares, and we weight the basket equally. So we would, be, we would be sitting on plus minus 4% in that particular share. We would sell that share out of the portfolio entirely on the, on the rebalance date, which happens in the middle of the year. But there will be other companies who over the course of that year and the course of the last five years had built up the track record they're in. So last year, uh, when we first launched this product in April last year, there were 22 companies in the portfolio. And then we adjusted the portfolio later on to include five companies, well, include seven companies and two were left out because they, they dropped their dividend for whatever reason. <laughs> the price will stay in the portfolio until we sell the share. Well, it may or may not. It may or may not. Maybe it didn't pay a dividend for a good reason, potentially. But um, the, the, the share value will stay in the index. And then we'll sell the share for its, its market value out of the index. So and you would, yeah. yeah, but yeah, but you would kick the share out at a, at a particular point in time. There's a mid, mid so the, I mean the most famous example in the U.S. market is General Electric was the flagship dividend payer. If you wanted a stable dividend in the U.S., you bought General Electric. You know, it was like the stock. The dividend aristocrats in the U.S. you've got to have like 20 years track record, or well, 25. There you go. Thank you. And, and they dropped a dividend. They got to build up that track record again before they allowed back in the index. Um, so it's a, it's a strict index from that regard. It's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's what's known as a – that sort of strictness is what's known in the indexing world as a, as a quality filter. You can never have complete foresight with these indexes because, of course, that's not what they're designed to do. They're rules-driven, but there's no one actively looking over it to say, well, this index – this share dropped its dividend, therefore we must kick it out now. We can't do that. We do what the index tells us to do. Okay, but you're saving and fees and a whole lot of other things and transparency because of that. You know, in an, active, in an actively managed portfolio, you sit with the risk that the investment committee comes in that day, and depending on whether Louis Urs has won the golf on Sunday or didn't, he comes into work in a slightly different mood, and he may or may not sell, sell the share out of the, out of the, out of the portfolio. So they, they, there's no emotion. These are rules-driven machines and indexes that are put through to us. 
but based on very strict rules with specific criteria. And then as the investor, you know exactly where you stand the whole time. There's complete transparency. Okay. Let, let, let me move on. And, and uh, it, was, uh, it was just a choice that was made available to us. You, you could, there are a number of different ways you could wait. You can do market cap weighting. You can use equal weighting. You can weight it according to its yield, potentially. There are a number of different ways that you can approach it. We worked with S&P Dow Jones on what we thought was the most appropriate, and we went with... Well, the bias with any... Um, what's happened here? We've run out of time. <laughs> let, 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 let me answer that question. So, the when in the indexing world, when you equally weight a portfolio rather than a market cap weighting a portfolio, what are you doing essentially? You're introducing another bias to the portfolio. The bias is as follows. The bias is towards the middle and smaller size companies rather than the big companies. Okay, so it's actually what's known, if you saw my circle diagram earlier, as the size factor. Okay, and the size factor, the theory basically is that uh, mid and small companies will outperform large companies on average type thing. That's kind of the theory, okay? So, um, so, so there's a, when you have a, a, an equally weighted portfolio, you're bringing in a size bias. And, and we were comfortable working with S&P that we, we actually quite like the size bias. Um, if, we had, if we had market cap weighted this index, uh, companies like Naspers who are in the index would have skewed the portfolio. Um, you, want an, you want a nice allotment to each of the stocks um, to give you a nice sort of balanced balanced portfolio. So that, that, that was our view anyway. And by the way, the, the dividend aristocrats ETF that I was referencing in the US, that's also equally, equally weighted. So equally weighted in itself is a smart beta strategy, okay, because you are, you're saying that I like smaller companies, okay, and Simon and I were talking about this in another interview the other day. I mean, if you think about it intuitively, companies who are very large in the market are more often than not very mature. Okay, so that's a good thing in some respects. It means that they uh, can raise debt cheaply. They can bully competitors. They've got a, a stable business model, but they mature from a growth perspective. I mean, if you remember like a classical uh, business cycle curve, you know, when you start off with a small company and then you grow and then you become mature. You, a mature company is not going to grow as quickly as a smaller company that is still growing, growing market share, growing margin, growing brand, growing, 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 growing. So intuitively, on average, Bigger companies are more mature companies, lower growth companies. On average, smaller companies are younger in their business cycle. I'm generalizing, obviously, because as I said that to Simon the other day, he points out that telecoms, <laughs> a smaller company, they've been around forever and they're terrible and they're not probably going to grow. But uh, I'm, I'm generalizing. Okay, so that's a size bias. Yeah. The fact is, if you don't like the weighting, don't buy the index. That's true. Exactly. So it's, it's, it's packaged and bottled up and you can buy it or don't buy it. That's exactly right. And that's what the indexing world offers the market, is the transparency uh, of it all. I don't actually need to go back to my slides. I think I'll just uh, wrap it up. The other, the other uh, index that we run, uh, here, there you go. The other index that we run, uh, I'm just going to flick forward, is the low volatility uh, index, which is our sort of house favorite uh, in, in many respects. Now, the theory here is as follows. Um, what S&P have done, and we've put an ETF on it, is to say, in our market, which shares have, have shown low levels of volatility? So their share prices move around less than others. And they take that basket of shares out. They take 40 of them, and they say that is a low volatility strategy. And then they weight the 40 shares, not depending on market cap, but on inverse of the volatility. So what I mean by that is if it's very volatile within the 40, then it's got a low weighting. If it's low volatility, then it's got a high, high weighting. So that's called a low volatility strategy or low risk sort of equity strategy. It tends to be 40, 30 to 40% less risky than the general market. But remarkably, the returns don't uh, show it that, that way. You know, when you walk into an investment lecture, University one Investments 101, you're taught that there's a correlation between risk and return. That relationship is, of course, true. Okay, don't, don't believe anyone who says it's not. But there can be some behavioral factors that play out in, in markets over time, and the low volatility anomaly is one of them. Okay, so let me try and explain the behavioral anomaly. Does anyone here play the lottery? Come on, own up. <laughs> yeah? Uh, so, I mean, if you think about the lottery, uh, I mean, I don't play it personally. If you do play, it doesn't matter. You 
donating to charity and it's a bit of fun. I think it's great. But if you think of the lottery ticket as an investment, right? That's a terrible bloody investment. I mean, you buy it for five bucks. The probability of a 10 million rand payoff is 0.0000000001%. And the probability of getting zero rand back is 99.9999999. Yet, I see people queuing at the shops every Friday whenever it is to buy it. Now, that sort of psychology of chasing, putting a small amount of money for very high risk, very high return, plays out in financial markets where people buy lottery ticket shares, okay, because they exist. Obviously, not in the same format, right? And it's, a, you know, exaggerating. But they, they, they exist where someone will be accepted to, to – be prepared to take higher risk to receive higher returns in the market by penny stocks or whatever. They take on the risk. The return never materializes. Okay. So the theory with low volatility is that on average, if you take the lower risk shares, the steady eddies as I call them, companies with robust strategies that the earnings are very reliable, like Safkin Breweries and Standard Bank and companies like that, who Yes, there might be some variability in their returns, but not a lot. We kind of know what they do, how they do it, how they make their money, and their shares are going to ebb along over time. Those sort of low volatility strategies actually tend to outperform strategies where people have taken on a lot of risk and the expectation of a lot of return, and the return doesn't materialize. Okay, so that's a low volatility uh, strategy. So check here. A point, this is uh, the risk matrix. You want a low bar here, not a high bar, Okay. So it's got 8.9 as the risk matrix compared to the general market, the SWIX of 11.8 or 12.6. So it's about a 30% odd less risky than the general market, less risky than beta. Okay. Yet look at the returns. Over one year, 15.6%. Over three years, 22.1%. Over five years, 22.5%. Remarkable. Um, so it's a, it's a solid, solid strategy, particularly for people who want exposure to the equity markets, but but a little bit nervous about the equity markets too, or want to take some money off the table. Again, if I can reference that conference that I was at recently in Europe, this is a major, major theme amongst pension funds and retirement funds, because of course they want as much equity in their portfolios as they can, but they're worried about the savers risk profile. So it's, it's, it's a big theme, a uh, uh, big theme glo uh, globally. And it's very difficult for this anomaly to fall away because it's not driven by anything other than human behavior. So it can't be arbitraged out of the market uh, very easily. And that's the return since we listed the product in April last year. And those are the companies that, um, that are in it. So as I say, companies you'd expect to have stable earnings, Standard Bank, um, I hope SAB is in there after saying it was, but it should be. No, it's actually not. That's true. Well, funny enough, it probably is quite volatile, SAB, isn't it? Because it flies around some days. Uh, but British American Tobacco, um, companies that have got stable, stable, uh, stable business models, visible, visible earnings form part of that uh, portfolio. It's got quite a high uh, property uh, pro property segment. Okay. Okay, that's all I had to say tonight. Uh, I'd love to take questions, starting from very simple questions at the start of the thing. There's no such thing as too simple. To some of the more clever ones as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, a property is a good investment to have a tax-free savings account because you would ordinarily pay tax on the rental income that gets paid out of a property ETF. Um, and that rental income grows over time. So, over a lifetime, that can be quite significant. Um, so, that's not bad advice that you were given. I would kind of go along with that. Um, and also, they, their capital generally rises over time. I mean, the list of property in our market has been a wonderful investment category. Um, so it's it's, it's just that solid solid advice. Which ETFs to include in a tax free savings account? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think I've have decided recently. I've I was looking on YouTube trying to get inspiration for my sort of ETF talk. So I went into Googled William Sharp, uh, one of the guys I introduced earlier. He's also a Nobel Prize winner, by the way. He's the guy who gives talks often on the winners and losers game, and 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 he invented the sharp ratio, which if you studied finance would know that's a very clever thing. Um, and and he taught he finishes off in terms of advice, investment advice. If you speak to a property mogul, he says the key to property investments is location, location, location. The key to investing generally is diversification, 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 and after that, keep costs low, keep costs low, keep costs low. 
So that is really, I think, in terms of the ETF world, what we're trying to achieve. These highly diversified products, you're not buy, any of the stocks that you buy here will have a, a spread of investments underneath it, and they're all, uh, all low cost. I, I mean, that, that's really how, how they're built. Uh, but if you buy a, a, a REIT, you pay tax on your earning, on your, you know, pay, pay you earn, yeah. uh, on your property, on your property ETF, what is the tax story? So, so you, you're right, I explained it. So as income that comes through the ETF, it retains its nature for tax purposes. So property companies pay rent out of their, out of their businesses, don't they? Well, they pay actually mm. an interest type return because it's debenture linked. Um, so you get an interest yield, so it's fully taxable depending on your tax rate, uh, on, on your personal tax uh, circumstances. That's why I say in a tax-free savings account, it's actually quite a good option. Okay, but if it's not in a tax-free account, um, one's just, you know, one's bought your, uh, if I were to on buy… On the coupons, that, yeah. that, that should form part of your taxable income. Yeah. And there, of course, there are a whole lot of deductions in there, the interest deductions, there are a whole lot of other deductions uh, and, and exemptions that… You know, I'm not a tax planner, tax expert, but just generally speaking, it's it's taxable, taxable income. Yeah. Gareth, okay, so some coming through. In, uh, I'll try that again. Some questions coming through in the webcast. First is, are we ever going to see a small cap slash alt X ETF for those people who do like lotto tickets? Um, and the second question from uh, Louise was, isn't can we consider an ETF even outside of a tax free savings account as an effective? tax vehicle because of the process of rebalancing, which doesn't impact us as the individual until we exit? Okay. On the first question around small cap indice, um, it's quite possible that we will, Simon. I, I don't know if our firm's going to bring one out. The, the, the trick with an ETF is that the liquidity of the ETF, remember liquidity is the ease to buy and sell shares in the market. So bigger companies tend to have bigger liquidity, smaller companies have smaller liquidity. There are less people trading in, uh, give me a penny stock name, tastes shares on any given day than trading in South African brewery shares on any given day. I mean, that's obvious, right? So when you put an, an ETF together, you need to ensure that the basket of shares that you're buying is sufficiently liquid so that you can buy the index in its, very, in its particular weighting. So it's, it's liquidity that we need to look at to see whether a small cap index uh, ETF can be put together. It would probably be a very nice vehicle for retail um, investors because it would stop people losing their shirt on one particular small cap company that they've bought and they would rather have a spread across that sector. So I like the idea. I like the idea of investing in small caps in a diversified manner. As to whether it can be put into an ETF, I'm less, I'm less sure we need to do some more work on that. On your second question, index investing – in general, whether you are doing it through an ETF or you're doing it through uh, through a tracker fund is more tax efficient from a churn perspective because what happens in a normal uh, – firstly, ETFs uh, don't pay capital gains within the ETF. So if uh, someone was asking me about selling, buying a share and selling another one out, when the ETF does that, there's no capital gains triggered. When you sell the ETF one day, there's capital gains at that level. But within the ETF, we don't pay any capital gains. So that means that we can change the index over time. We don't trigger any tax. You only trigger tax when you sell the, 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 the instrument. So by and large, yes, there are tax benefits. Um, and index investing, generally speaking, has less churn. So you, you, you generate less tax. Tax as defined by capital gains tax tax as defined by sec, um, stamps and other taxes that the government levies whenever you trade a share. Um, so, yeah. And then before we get to the – folks, we're going to pass the mic around so you can pick up on the webcast. Another question coming through. What type of diversification – I'm going to take the point as like a percentage split – could one suggest between active and passive? In other words, a core of active, of, of passive and a satellite of, of active, what would be a, a, a split between those two? And, and, and that is preface, in your opinion, with uh, no, um, uh, 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 what's the word came through, no uh, prejudice, if you get it wrong. No prejudice, 50-50, I don't know. Look, it, de it, depends on the, it depends on the investor, and it depends whether – the investor is going to be their own active manager or not, and then the skill of that particular individual. Um, so if you had the heart of your investments uh, in indexing, which you know is going to be diversified, low cost, sort of all the arguments I was putting together tonight, that's a pretty solid base, right? So if you're going to venture out of that, you kind of need to know what you're doing. Either you've got high conviction 
in a particular manager who's going to deliver a particular return on a particular mandate, conviction enough to pay him the extra 70 odd basis points, or you've got a conviction in your own ability to generate that outperform performance. If the conviction isn't there, then default back to indexing. Okay. If you've got big conviction, then, then, then stray more towards active management. It's interesting. Warren Buffett himself last year said, now Warren Buffett, as you all know, he is Mr. Active Management. He is Mr. Value. He's written books about investing and so on. Yet, do you know that last year he recommended that of his estate, 90% of it should go into the S&P 500, an index fund? And he said that because uh, basically he's backing passive management and, and all of the arguments that, are, that, that I've put forward, that that type of investment strategy on average will outperform a high cost um, a, a, a high cost strategy over time. It was the advice to his wife, and you can go and go and Google it and see the context in which that con that 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 comment was made. But generally speaking, um, index investing is a very very sound approach to the market, and and I would encourage you to do, to make it a big part of your part of your strategy. As I say, how the mix plays out depends on your conviction of a manager or a particular solution that's been put to you, or your own ability to outperform the index. Now, many people like myself are, are hobby investors in the stock exchange. And there's nothing wrong with that. You may want to have your little portfolio of stuff that's fun for you. You enjoy trading and you enjoy watching these companies and these are your favorites and you go to their presentations and stuff. That's great. It's fun. It's, it's, uh, it's enjoying as a, as a hobbyist investor. Should you have all of your money in that type of strategy? Probably not. You know, Probably you want to have a chunk of it chugging along with the general market is at the lowest prop, uh, uh, possible cost. Long-winded answer to a simple question, eh? Gareth, with the um, ETFs and, and, and the, these new beta ETFs, with the, you've got the mathematical formulas behind it controlling yes. a lot of this. If I hear you correctly, you still sit down as a committee and make a decision. You, this is not – the mathematics are not dropping in and dropping out these – no, the, uh, no, okay. Let, let, yeah, just to carry on, just for, yeah. if you go to management, and management is such a critical part of running a good company, how do you weight them? How do you yes. measure them? Because yeah. uh, that's got to be on some sort of subjective yes. level, surely. Uh, no, actually. Um, so I, I should have been more guarded when I made that comment earlier. Um, when I spoke about the choice of equally weighting, it was a choice prior to us launching the index, in fact. So uh, what happened was, I'm going back sort of two years now, um, S&P Dow Jones came to see our particular firm and said that we're thinking about bringing out certain indexes. And we jumped to them and said, if you're bringing out certain indexes, please make sure you, you bring out the different aristocrats index. We love that index as a house view. Then they said to us, well, which one do you want? Because we've got a whole lot of different variations of it. We, we can do one that's equally weighted. We can do one that's yield weighted. We can do one that's based on size. We can do one that includes property, excludes property. There's so many different ways to approach that particular investment philosophy. So we sat down with them as two organizations and we thrashed it out a bit until we came out with the solution that we thought best fitted our market. Then the index was cast in stone. No more autonomy given to anyone in my organization. S&P has a little bit of autonomy at a committee level where they can tweak certain things in the index, but it's not on an on a active basis where they're trying to achieve something fresh. It's really just to look at market dynamics. Maybe there's something fundamental uh, that's changed. You know, maybe, for instance, um, the South African market in terms of the number of listings that we have in our market has grown. So maybe they want to increase something, a particular rule based on the, the growth of the market. Okay. So there's certain things, or they may want to change something to do with the liquidity. There's subtle changes that they may bring through at a committee level. They are the index license saw. We are the index licensee. When we put the product out, we cannot change a thing. The rules are the rules. It's a transparent portfolio. If we go and see a company and they say, Gee, they are having the best year ever. They are cracking market share. We can't go back and say, well, let's think of that share up a bit in the portfolio. None of that. Or, or vice versa, if they're having a terrible year, we can't take them out either. Then how does the dropping of Kumba or iron or any resource Because it, was based, on, it, was, ba it was based on facts. So it was looking at historical data. It was based on factual data available to, to all of the market. Because there's so much data that comes through. I mean, S&P, for instance, who we're doing all this work with, I mean, they have built global infrastructure to calculate these indexes. 
And with that global infra infrastructure, a lot of it's sort of digital infrastructure, they will pull all of this data out of the JSC, out of the Bang uh, Bangkok Stock Exchange, out of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, and they will mine all of this data and they will come up with indexes. But it's historical data. It's data, data that's publicly available either through how the shares trading and performing or how, to, how the financial results are looking or how analyst forecasts are looking, but it's, it's data that's readily available. There's no subjective element brought into it. And that, and that for me is, is key to the index story because it means it's completely transparent um, in terms of how the index is put, uh, is put together. Whereas other active portfolios, well, they can they can swing and move by the manager's mood on a day, quite honestly. So so that's really one of the big differences. He, the manager, of course, might be right, might be wrong in terms of how he sees sees the world. Uh, for instance, investing in the top 50 and the low volatility ETF uh, from a cost perspective. From a cost perspective, if I have 200,000 rand, can I put 100,000 in one and 100,000 in? Another looking at the total expense ratio. Yeah, they, the, the the different strategies will differ slightly from an expense point of view. So you'll appreciate that putting some of these fancy indexes together takes more work than some of the simple indexes. So the costs there are slightly more than the simple indexes. So if you're just in the simple indexes from a cost perspective, you'd be paying a slightly lower lower fee. From an investment return perspective, there's absolutely benefit in pairing up ETFs together. It can be quite a complicated exercise, so it depends on your skills as an investor. But like looking at this circle that I showed you earlier where you've got market cap, value, volatility, momentum, size, and quality, these factors will do differently at different times in the market cycle. So what you might want to do, for instance, is pair a momentum strategy together with a low volatility strategy because they're very uh, uncorrelated in their, in, their return, in their return profile. Okay. Ladies and gents, we'll pause it there. Uh, Gareth, very much appreciate your time this evening and for helping us be smarter around uh, ETFs. Um, and very much appreciate everyone coming through here, fighting, load shedding, <laughs> traffic, Santon, yeah, you know, actually just life in Joburg. We love Josie, so we won't complain. Uh, to the folks in the webcast, of course, they know nothing about this. Uh, as I said, we are back 13 August. That is with Darvi Ruert, uh, Chief Economist at uh, uh, Efficient Group. If you go to justfunlap.com, there's details there already. The invitation from the JSC will be being sent out in a week or two. Uh, thanks, everyone, for their time. Gareth, thanks again. Cheers, all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.